So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, elsewhere, not so many mega cities, sometimes mega cities I suppose, um, but also different kinds of cities. So I have that unenviable task of standing in London and talking to people from London about other cities, which is always annoying. Um, and to some extent the future as well, which is equally annoying or frustrating in that we don't really know what it's going to be, uh, but we have to do something with it nonetheless. So I will do my best. Um, and when we were talking about this uh, with Jonathan and Kate and others, we sort of came up with this half-formed thought about there are some very radical things going on in cities at the moment, which simultaneously increasingly seem very everyday or happen very quickly and just become commonplace. And some of the things you talk about, those are actually quite radical shifts, Pat, as you know. And yet we completely take them for granted all of a sudden. You know? So it's kind of an interesting thing about cities, that they can actually change quickly, potentially. And culture can change quickly. Any, any of us, you talk about smoking, but those of us who grew up with uh, British food in the 70s and 80s might remember how different it was then to how it is now. So I, great, I take great hope from that because it means that culture can change. It's quite malleable and fluid, actually, if we deal with it. Uh, I often start my quote with this, sorry, my talk with this quote because I, I deal with technology a lot. And Cedric Price is one of the great British architects, I think. Great in many, many, many ways. He built about two buildings ever, but um, nonetheless, massively influential. Uh, and he said in about 65 or 66, technology is the answer, but what was the question? And we still don't ask that enough, you know, kind of th just stop and think that 30, 40, 50 years later. We jump on technologies because they seem like solutions and we're a sort of a solution-oriented species, I suspect. Um, and yet, if you think about the, the maneuvers going around in the 50s and 60s around the way the car shapes the city, we probably should have asked, <laughs> hang on a minute, what kind of London do we want? Or what kind of Paris do we want? Or what kind of Los Angeles do we want? Before we rip out, say, trams and bikes, which you know, we're now spending hundreds of millions of dollars putting them back into those cities. Um, and excuse the really bad quality video, but this is what uh, a video from a mobile phone used to look like a few years ago. None of you will remember that, those of you younger than 30. But this is a lovely book from 1966. I'm not, it doesn't really matter, actually, that you can't see it because um, you get the gist of it. This, this is a book from 66 about the way that we thought transport was going to change the city then. This was the time when Soho was going to be raised for multi-lane expressways in, in London. Luckily we dodged that bullet, but a lot of London didn't dodge the bullet elsewhere. It's kind of telling. Actually on the back page there's one picture of a bike in the whole thing <laughs> and it's just like in the index at the back. You know, everything else is kind of cars. Uh, there were some flying cars, but not as many as you might think. And funnily enough, they still keep coming back as an idea, which is nuts, I think, as if we need to congest the air as well as the roads. Um, and moving pavements, which people thought was going to be a really big deal in the middle of cities, <laughs> which sort of tells you a lot, but anyway. Um, now, what we have now are these slightly postman pack like things already emerging, however. This is in the EPFL campus in Lausanne, so a design school. And this is a self-driving bus, a self-driving shuttle, just kind of tootling around, doing actually quite useful things like, you know, prams or if it's raining or if you've got savvy shopping or if you've got loads, in this case, loads of big kind of artworks to carry about. Just to be clear, that's how fast it goes. <laughs> that speeded up film. That speeded up film, it, that, it's going to jump backwards and forwards like this. It goes about 12 kilometers an hour or something like that. It's very, very slow. 15 kilometers an hour, I think. It can go faster. There's a French, this is French actually, easy mile makes this start up. There's another one which you showed a picture of, Pat, which goes about 40, 50 kilometers an hour. It asks actually though an interesting question, how fast should they go? They shouldn't necessarily go 50 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour. We don't need them to do that. They're not that kind of thing. So this is quite good actually if it goes that slow <laughs> in this context. Um, because it suggests, again, the question, what about all those fiddly little journeys in and around neighborhoods that you might want something just to get to a transport hub from your house. Those are interesting things. The big number there, which you might see from ETH and Zurich, MIT and others, 80% of private car use could be replaced by shared autonomous shuttle fleets. If you had an on-demand shared fleet like that, you could seriously remove a, a lot of private car use. Now that's looking at cities like New York and Singapore, not like London really Singapore, uh, greater Zurich region, also not like London, but somewhere between those. 
there's a number for London, which we don't know, to be clear, but we're interested to understand what it could be. What are all those journeys that you could take off the road if you have a shared fleet like that? Similar dynamics moving across different things. In San Francisco, they were looking at a big sewer upgrade, $1.5 billion to deal with the excess stormwater running down the drains when it rains heavily, which it does increasingly. Uh, a smart guy called Nicholas de Monshaw at UC Berkeley figured out you could take 1,500 small plots and just plant trees on them instead. And that would actually deal with the stormwater. Probably 96% of the stormwater would be dealt with in that way for half the money and you get parks, <laughs> 1,500 small parks. You don't really want kids playing in sewers, I suspect, but that's what a sewer upgrade would do. Whereas planting trees and greening places up reduces the heat land effect, you know, it cleans the air, it creates parks, and is infrastructure at the same time. So this kind of distributed approach, as with the previous thing, is very interesting. And involving people in things, this is, uh, it doesn't look very nice, but it is very nice, I assure you. This is a Berlin-based co-housing project. Baugruppen in Berlin is collaborative ownership of uh, housing. So it's built by people rather than developers as <coughs> such. They still work with architects and engineers. They just buy the land and they design it with them. It's now something like 15% of Berlin's new housing stock every year. It's way cheaper, 20% cheaper on average. Sustainability is much, much higher than the market produces. And it's woven around real people's lives. So essentially architecturally got some maneuvers in here that are built around what people really need. All of these things are maneuvers towards a different way of doing cities. And then you can see um, cities beginning to push, in this case we're talking about mobility a lot, push the private car out. So Paris pushing out on this one. Oslo uh, announced that no, no effectively private cars in the city centre, a bit of a backlash about that. Now they're squeezing the parking instead. So this is what's going on. Nonetheless, we don't know what's going to happen because we live in an age of what the US military has this phrase, VUCA which they invented after the Cold War when they realized they'd accidentally built a military to fight the Soviet Union, which wasn't there anymore, and then they had to suddenly fight something like Al-Qaeda, and it was, oh, that's complex, or it's actually volatile and certain complex and ambiguous. So they came up with this phrase as a shorthand for what we face, which we see all around us, whether it's uh, Britain's amazing um, political performance recently or something else. And it's not just things like that, it's just even predicting the future is really hard. These were the UK government's predictions of solar cell take up. This was the low estimate by 2030. When we get to 1,000 megawatts installed, medium estimate, what actually happened was this. It flew off the shelves, basically. Once they reached the right price point and people thought, well, of course, I'd rather have solar cells than not. Um, but that wasn't something the government saw coming at all. Massive difference in what they expected. So I quite like this quote. You can ignore most of the pink stuff, but Michael Spence, who's an economist, we don't know what it's going to be like 10 years from now, really. Never mind 20, 30, which is what we're dealing with when we're planning something like the Olympic Park, 50 years, 100 years. The best focus is to make the transitions as effective and painless as possible. So how do we remain adaptable and agile and be able to move through things? Uh, a friend of mine sent me this from a Japanese ski village. They're, of course, in Japan, they have a much crisper way of saying that. <laughs> no one knows what the future holds. Snowboard cannot stop immediately. Just, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, this one, trees do not move, you move. Trees are hard, bones are fragile. <laughs> so, um, in typically Japanese way, they've encapsulated it in a, a haiku instead. Um, so, the project that we're doing in Amsterdam is a bit like this. I'm sorry I'm going so fast. But I'll um, we're looking at, instead of trying planning, which is, you know, let's draw a picture of 2040, hand it to the council, the council signs it off, we all cross our fingers and hope that's going to happen, it doesn't ever happen. Um, in reality, it's let's do a series of wiggles towards the future, consciously, uh, and we take numerous readings along the way. Simple as that. You know, imagine navigating a small boat to the North Pole. You don't need to know not true north all the time. You need to set off in a northerly direction and take regular compass readings. You can avoid the icebergs on the way that way. You can wiggle your way there. So it's a different kind of thing. It's more agile. So how do you do that with heavy infrastructure, like things like roads and trains? Well, these new technologies are interesting. These networked things, whether it's car sharing or bike sharing, or in this case, energy. Instead of having a big old district heating plant, which is kind of a 50-year bet, you build that, it's going to be there for 50 years, it's a big thing, you can't just unplug it. The capital cost is spread over 50 years. You could have half the size 
and a bunch of microgrids with local renewables, could be solar cells or whatever, and batteries. This is far more adaptable. You can increase capacity in that just by adding more of those. You can take them away if they turn out to be a bad bet. And you've saved a lot of money there. So we're looking at these kind of business as usual versus network systems. So it's always this balance. You know, business as usual would be in a crossrail, for instance. I know that sounds a nasty thing to say about a major transport project, but it is a type of transport infrastructure. What we're talking about with car sharing, autonomous vehicles, you know, these are sort of network technologies. They're a different thing. This is mass transit. This is a network transit. This can run in the gaps left by this thing. So it's just this balance. And when do you do one and when do you do the other? When you shift from 80-20 to 70-30, 60-40, and is it always 90-10? You know, this is the question we're wrestling with. So we are looking across lots of different things here. How does that thing enable you to unlock the streets through adaptable parking structures? This is all stuff with Amsterdam. How do you, instead of people just going up and then parking having to go up, traditional linear relationship, most councils have, if you build a block, you've got to put you know, 0.7 parking spaces per apartment, 1.5, depends on where you are, but it goes up in a linear way. If we can put downward pressure on private car use, you can take that parking away at some point. So you kind of want parking with a sell-by date on it, really, that you can quickly transform, like a, you know, something that kind of parking goes off, like a pint of milk at some point. So we've looked at how do you do that? When you start your development, you maybe build some parking, but just put it over there, don't put it too close, because as over five, 10 years, when parking is less relevant, you need to be able to quickly change it to, in this case, another building. Or if you're building underground parking to begin with, like in this one, underneath these two buildings, can you stick a cap on it so that you can pop the cap off at some point, and then you get a nice sunken courtyard instead? So how do you build in this adaptability and flex? I'll skip through this variations on that, as you imagine. How do you turn, again, parking into green space, flood water storage? This was Amsterdam, so that's, that's a big thing. So then this, and obviously, you know, talking about Paris in London is never a popular thing, but I think this, the thing that Deputy Mayor Jean-Louis Missica said the other day was so interesting. He said this last week, or about 10 days ago, about autonomous vehicles, right? So again, we, five years, 10 years ago maybe, I wasn't talking about autonomous vehicles. I expect many people weren't, you know, except in research context. We weren't really thinking about them as in, this is the list of things that cities need to think about quite rapidly. He's saying, unless we design the rules of the game before 2020, it's going to be a right old mess. I didn't say that, he said something in French, but the French for a right old mess. <laughs> um, and he said, we should announce before 2020 that in Paris, no privately owned autonomous vehicle will be allowed. It will only be mobility as a service, not mobility as ownership. Incredibly interesting, brave. Now, it's, sometimes it's easy for deputy mayors to say that thing, and then there's a wide gap before policy and regulation, clearly. But interesting even to test that, and for a deputy mayor to even say that is interesting, to actually lead the conversation like that. Many municipalities are still, well, we don't know what the market's going to do, so we'll have to see what happens, and then we'll react, and then you know, we'll figure it out. That isn't the data-driven strategy thing I was talking about before. You have a trajectory. You have a trajectory, and you head in that way because you have a set of outcomes you want for your city. That's what Misica is doing here. Otherwise, market will happen to you. I don't probably need to say much more about the issues around things like Uber, but it's significant if you're caught on the back foot. So again, I don't know what French is for, get on the front foot, because they don't play cricket. But, <laughs> What is, that, what is it that we need to get on the front foot about? How do we do that? How do we begin to test these things? There's a pretty good primer by Bloomberg. I won't go through it again because we don't really have time, but there's some key things. We have a narrow window to, share the, to shape the spread of autonomous vehicles. It's changing, actually, the ways that cities could work. It's a vital technology for particular populations, like aging, for instance. It could be a huge shift in the way that people move around. And we need to work with private and public sector together, but the government has to be a real agent of change there, has to step up and shape the way things happen. So for instance, Barcelona, I mentioned Oslo and Paris earlier, their super block strategy is super nice, dare I say it. Um, you know, in a way, this is kind of the original idea of 1859 when Serda laid this out, actually being realized 150 odd years later by really intensifying how these places work as urban spaces without private traffic, or at least private traffic massively minimized. 
and they have a series of ways of then conveying. This is from, you know, really beautiful illustrations, kind of, just kind of explaining to people what would be the benefit of the super blocks around mobility. You notice the cargo bikes on there, around connected communities, about the ability to then green the streets because you don't have vehicles running through them in quite the same way, much more fluid streetscapes. Sustainability becomes something that's much more viable. You can use electric vehicles as batteries, for instance, with local, locally owned renewables in their case. Public spaces in the way that Pat describes so eloquently, you know, and beyond. And participation being key to unlocking all of that. And I'll just return to that in a moment. Um, so, and again, these things are, are real. Helsinki for the last year has been trialing this, um, this little thing. Very, very slow, again, particular journeys but they've been running for a year now on public streets. The law in Finland means you can test that. And so they're going live with this in September. And I know this seems incredibly, I mean, this is a bit like looking at that film of probably moving pavements in 1965. We don't know this is the answer. And to be clear, this is version one of something that by version five might be all right. But this, the rate of change in that technology is much faster than things we've seen before. That was the other thing that Bloomberg said, actually, that the uptake of these could be faster than the uptake of the previous generation of automotives in the 50s and 60s. Uh, then you have other things, you know, these kind of logistics systems by the likes of Amazon uh, uh, taking parcels to you. We know in London we have a huge problem with white vans because of our addiction to internet retail. It's massively uh, problematic from a street's point of view. This isn't the answer. Again, we do these designs and sketches. This is a patent application that Amazon lodged about three weeks ago. But how do you design delivery straight to this place so you don't have to go in here? Now, that interestingly, could work in some urban conditions. In others, it just won't at all. I don't particularly want drones flying over primary schools for obvious reasons. So it's incredibly hard. But most of our planning is thought about this in a very 2D way. So you do we need actually zoning of 3D in a different way there? We're sort of thinking about that Arab, about models we might build around that. I think this is actually a far more viable, personally, solution for logistics in cities. Series of consolidation drop-offs, last mile or miles done on cargo bike. In Berlin, they reckon 92% of all deliveries in the city could be done on a cargo bike. Anything smaller than, frankly, a sofa or a fridge freezer, um, even then. So, and the, these are really powerful. And if you think about that, that is also a distributed network system. You know, it's, it's, he's got a, an app in his pocket. You can say, actually, I'm not home at 7, I'm home at 8, slide. That will work. But it's a bike at the same time. It's something from the 1880s and 2017 at the same time. Amsterdam's working on this, an autonomous, because it's Amsterdam, everything's a bit wet. Um, a little autonomous ferry that buzzes around. These are interesting even at night because they're quiet, because they're electric. They can navigate at night because they don't need to see in the way that we see. Um, so deliveries could change in a very different way. So finally, this point about participation. I talked about Oslo and Barcelona and Paris and you know Helsinki and all those nice places. <laughs> in all of those places, they are trying to squeeze private car use out of the city in very, very direct, uh, almost aggressive, one might say, ways, and which I actually fully applaud. But of course, there's resistance. You know, shopkeepers saying, "Well, people won't shop at our shops because of cars not being able to get there." And there is enough data about that one, seriously. You know, there's data from the UK, Bristol, a few years ago, when they asked shopkeepers, how do you think people come to your shops? They said, well, 50% come by car. It's 25% in reality. You know, they just double what they think the reality is. So we have a lot of data about that. It doesn't change retail, actually. And we need to get on the front foot about those things. In fact, of course, people shop on foot in reality. Nonetheless, even in places like Barcelona or Oslo, uh, there is, uh, you'll see the phrase, fierce backlash, or Oslo, furious backlash. <laughs> I want to minimize the amount of furious backlashes that London will have to face, personally, as we transition in this way. And we need to take people with us for that kind of thing. So we're doing a little bit of work in Stockholm with Ericsson R&D, actually. And this is one thing. There are numerous other ways of doing participation. I think you're you know, pulling people to the streets and doing events in the streets. Another very, very strong way of getting people engaged, actually in the reality of what a real street is, as Pat showed those pictures of how it used to be and then stepping into what it is now. Another way of doing that is to change the way we communicate with people. So Pat's seen this before. Um, had I had the soundtrack turned up, there would be some very uh, solemn Philip Glass playing in the background now to make this even sadder. But this is the way we communicate with people about things that are about to happen 
Ah, oh, thank you for the <laughs> sad music. Just take a moment to reflect on how a 21st century city communicates with its citizens about, you know, this could be a 12-story apartment block at the end of your street. You might also get a letter through the door if you're within a certain radius, but in reality, it's pretty much this. You know, we tie a piece of A4 to a lamppost in the rain and hope you might look at it. I mean, it's just, it's really not trying very hard. And the cynics amongst you would say, well, that's on purpose, because we don't really want you to try hard, because that just means complaints, and that just uh, slows everything down. When people have done participation seriously, real engagement, it speeds things up. In Chile, they had to master plan a city of Constitucion, 50,000 people, they did it in 90 days, with about 5,000 people involved, actively engaged in real conversations, 94% success in the vote for the master plan that popped out the other end, because people had already decided that was what they wanted, because they were involved in it. I don't know why they had the vote, to be honest. Whereas that, <laughs> I don't know if that's maybe for dogs or something, but um, this is almost like a metaphor for the way we communicate around planning. So we can do a bit better. Um, there are lots of ways you can do it. San Francisco has this lovely parklets program which gives people tools to shape the city directly. Not easy, and because America is the most bureaucratic place on the planet, despite all their fine rhetoric about markets and efficiency, it's a disaster. So in reality, in a city, there are numerous bits of paperwork you have to get through. But this is how the city of San Francisco has made that kit for parklets to enable you to do it. They've actually tried hard, as you can see. They made it engaging. I almost feel like I want to look at this, <laughs> as opposed to most uh, documents from US cities. Uh, it goes through the process. There's still lots of regulation going on here, but that's how you get a parklet done. And they've got on the front foot again and said, we're going to give you, citizens, the tools by which you can shape the city, within certain bounds, of course. It's, that's the art of policy. How do you engage citizens to enable them to do the things they want to do in a way that actually benefits everybody else as well? It's that balancing act. So very, very basic things we're doing in uh, Stockholm, we're sort of looking at how would you do a different planning notice? This is a little bit techy. It doesn't have to be like this, by the way. This is obviously filmed in London, as you can see, but that's the city of Stockholm thing. So if you held up a, a phone, it would just say, here's where a bike shelter is going to be. Or it could be like this, you know, or it could be like this. Actually in situ, in the place, save it to your proposals for later. When you go home, you might engage with it a bit more. What if you did that, you know? What if it had a coffee kiosk next to it or solar cells on the roof? Actually, you can make a proposal in that way. And it's important that that wasn't like, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, because I think that's too banal for something quite important, like taking a chunk of pavement. So the save to your proposals later implies there would be further engagement. And that importantly includes public things, face-to-face -face meetings. You know, you can't do this stuff on Facebook. It's not the right platform for it. You can use digital in a light touch way like this. Equally, many of you will have been in meetings where there's something like this. It's filmed in our office, but um, there's a model. And then, so what if you could drop something into the model and then see some kind of performance of the thing? In this case, it's just showing the soul again. And then if you turn it around, it then says, well, it's 30%, because now it's in shadow a bit more than it was previously. Very, very simple light touch things. And the important thing is people love physical models. They're really engaging. You can pull 10 people around it. And unlike virtual reality, I'm not asking anybody to strap a computer to their face. You know, that's kind of a really awkward thing to do, particularly with real people. Uh, but you could have, a, you can imagine 10 people around a model shoving things around. That happens in meetings all the time. This is one I was in for an Imperial College plan. You know, I'm not asking people to put a virtual reality headset on in this context. But when we do this moving around, this is with allies, great planners about this kind of thing, um, there's no implication of your decisions. You sort of slide the tower block that way and say, oh, what if we had a swimming pool here? And then we have to go away and say, right, okay, see you in three weeks, we've got to do a load of calculations. It slows everything down again. You don't really get this kind of implication of the decision. What if we did take the parking away? It's a big deal. And we'd have to deal with that some other way. Now that little AR thing, that overlay, would enable you to see more or less in real time, this would be the impact. That's what you need to deal with. So very light touch things. Finally, user experience. So in Helsinki now, it's got one of the most widely used city bikes platforms, shared bikes systems in Europe, because they made it work across all their systems instantly straight away in a very Helsinki-like way. <coughs> so you can pay your equivalent of the Oyster card to unlock the bike, which is still quite tricky in a lot of other cities, which is why it doesn't get used as much. 
So there's the kind of sense of what the street is, is then there's potentially this constantly fluid moving, what Jane Jacobs would have called like the ballet of the street, which funnily enough is a bit like what we used to have. This is Sydney in 1906, and just look at the movement patterns there. The edge of the pavement is sort of over there, but people are here. Sorry about the green equality, but it was 1906. Um, there's trams constantly, you know, it's this, and of course there were deaths, and I don't want to over-romanticize it, but we don't have to have those deaths now for a whole number of reasons, and yet we could unlock that kind of fluidity to the street, which means this isn't uh, one of our projects, this is MVRDV, the Dutch planners. Is the back, you know, is your back street actually something more like this? Question mark. It's not to say, again, that's the answer for London. This was maybe for somewhere in the Netherlands. And you maybe need a little bit more than that to get a delivery thing up at every now and then, or some bikes, you know, you don't necessarily want to be running over gravel, but it could be a far more fluid, far greener, far safer, more engaging kind of place, just by going after cars in that way. And I call this principle about technology in, city out. In a funny way, if we use robots correctly, we humanize the city. <laughs> if we don't use robots correctly, we will go the other way. The opportunity is enormous, potentially. Um, but we have to grasp it. These things will not happen by themselves. As Misica said, we've probably got actually relatively short time frames. He was talking about by 2030, we need to have it sorted by 2020. Shared infrastructure is, pro is the profound shift here. That's mainly what my talk has been about. The user experience, incredibly important. And as we convey it in very meaningful ways for people and it feels like a compelling experience, not gonna happen. People have very high expectations now, quite rightly, of the way that things should work genuinely holistic outcomes, prototypes first, evidence second. We need to test this stuff. It's not something that we can run through a model or commission a report around. You need to test it. What is an autonomous vehicle going to be like next to all the bikes that we saw earlier? That is an unknown question. California is not looking into it because they don't have bikes in California, really. <laughs> um, use design to make these things tangible, so that's a lot of what we do. Other people do that as well. And it's got to be genuinely participative. We have to take people with us. That's when you get culture change, as we did around things like smoking and food and things like that. Food's a great case study. Look at how that changed. And ultimately, finally, this is, this is what cities are about. It's about shared spaces, shared resources. We live with other people. That's the whole point of cities. So um, thank you. <laughs>